Hello, everyone online. Can you hear me? Can I get thumbs up or just like a yes? Incredible. Thanks, guys, so much. Um, my name is Emily McGrath. I am the EDR specialist with the Colorado Department of Agriculture's Not Just Food Program. Yep, I'm Robert Walters. I'm the Invasive Species Program Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And then we will also have Ashley Russ joining us later. Um, and first of all, I want to just thank you guys for showing up. Uh, this is the second year that I have done this, but I know you've been doing it for quite a bit longer. I've lost count, but we'll give you many, a many history years. on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. So in person, we are offering CECs both for in person and online. So if you're in person, we have the forms over there. Uh, you can grab it now. You can grab it at the break. It doesn't matter. Um, and then. Basically, you do need to attend the, the entire training, and it's one laws and regulations credit and one is water credit. Um, and that goes for people online, too. You do have to be here for the entire time in order to get those credits. Um, besides that, we are offering uh, live Spanish translation. So if you would like to um, take advantage of that, we're just going to ask that you, um, I think that there's language options in more. And you select the language interpretation option, and then you're going to want to mute the original audio, most likely, unless you want to listen to both at once. But that may be a lot. Outstanding. Um, well, thanks to Emily for inviting me to participate in today's workshop. Um, again, my name is Robert Walters. I'm the Invasive Species Program Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, I've been with our Invasive Species Program since 2012 and did some weed management for the National Park Service prior to that. So I've been doing this for about 20 years. So I have the great pleasure of providing just a little bit of background on where in the world this workshop came from. I stepped into this pretty late, so it's a little bit of telephone, but how quickly you become the old guy that's been around a while. So I'm the best candidate we got to try to carry the torch here. So just a little bit of history on purple loosestrife management here in the state in this workshop. Back in 1993, an awesome gentleman by the name of Mr. Dave Weber began the Colorado Weed Network. Shortly after that, in 1999, um, Dave formed the Purple Loose Strike Task Force. The, really, the purpose of this task force was to mitigate the impacts of Purple Loose Strike to the wildlife here in the state. At that time, he was operating a team of temporary technicians around the Denver metro area. Um, from eventually June to August, he was working in 16 different cities and four counties. Dave's time with the Division of Wildlife, now Parks and Wildlife, concluded in 2002. That doesn't mean that Dave stopped doing all this. He was incredibly dedicated to this effort and continued to do it long after his retirement. In 2003, we had the weed law passed here in Colorado, which made purple loose stripe a um, list A species, mandatory for eradication efforts. 2004, Dave's team, again with the Division of Wildlife, now Parks and Wildlife, turned over the control and management efforts to all of you. Our local landowners and managers are really the ones doing the vast majority of the work on the ground these days. At the time, we had 80 to 90 private landowners, eight counties, numerous cities, and over 430 sites in the Purple Blue Stripe database. I guess and Emily will tell you what that number looks like today. I'm guessing it's a lot higher. 2008, the awesome program that I have the pleasure of working for, CPW's ANS or Invasive Species Program. Can I just speak up just a little bit? Yes, you can. I can absolutely and do that. slow down a little bit. I can try. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2008, our CPW Invasive Species Program, or what we more commonly refer to as our Aquatic Nuisance Species Program, was created. Um, our program is really focused on aquatic invasive species. We don't get too much into the terrestrial stuff. In 2009, there was a little bit of a division of the workload between the Division of Wildlife and the Department of Agriculture. At the time, the Division of Wildlife was really trying to work on a purple loose strike newsletter. We were participating in these trainings and managing some of the data, and the Department of Agriculture was assisting with field control and also, again, the counties, cities, and landowners. Um, we're really doing the control efforts on the ground. Things have changed quite a bit over the last 10 to 15 years. I'm going to give credit to Emily and her team here at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. What does CPW do with Purple Loose Stripe these days? Emily's laughing a little bit if you can't see that. She invites me to hang out at this workshop once per year. We do management on our own properties. 
and that's pretty much it. The most of the work is being done by the Department of Agriculture. Again, credit to them and their team. She has the list A field team that assists with control. They work on receiving, verifying, and mapping these reports, monitoring control efforts, record keeping, and the very awesome purple loose stripe fighter pins and certificates. Hopefully we're still getting some of those out there. I still have some in my desk if you need them, Emily. So. I have pins, no oh. certificates. Okay. I didn't I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> You can, if you email me, I'll send you a <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but again, it's really all of you folks, the cities, the county, counties, the private landowners, the consulting firms that are doing the vast majority of the work out there on the ground. Just like all invasive species management, this is really a partnership effort. There's really no way that one agency or jurisdiction can succeed in this alone. So that's where things started. It's been about 10 years on this. Um, we've kind of flexed out what this training looks like over the last several years. I think we're doing a great job with purple loose strike management on the ground, but we have all sorts of other things that continue to rise to the front in terms of things we're dealing with, with aquatics and aquatic invasive species and just general aquatic issues. So thanks to Emily and the team for kind of letting us stretch this out a little bit to talk about some issues other than purple loose strike and hairy willower. So. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you about CPW's Aquatic Nuisance Species Program. All right, so the mission of CPW's Aquatic Nuisance Species Program is to protect wildlife, recreation, natural resources, infrastructure, and the economy by preventing the introduction of zebra and quagga mussels. These are the primary focus of our program, as well as other aquatic nuisance species by containing current infestations and stopping their spread into new waters. Not a small task, but again, with all of our partners on board, we do have a great chance of actually living out this mission. The authority for us to implement this program was granted to us by Senate Bill 08-226 back in 2008, which formalized our state ANS program. I'm going to try to say this really, really slow, but I tend to say it really, really fast. It made it illegal to possess import, export, ship, transport, release, plant, place, or cause an ANS to be released anywhere here in Colorado. It also gave us authority for what we term authorized agents. That's just a legal term for one of our boat inspectors to inspect and decontaminate watercraft for the purpose of ANS or aquatic nuisance species prevention. And it also did create in the state treasury um, a ANS fund. Our program costs somewhere in the proximity of seven million dollars each and every year. The focus of that program is really preventing these species from being introduced into our state. So this is the definition of an ANS per that Senate Bill 08-226. An aquatic nuisance species means an exotic or non-native aquatic wildlife or plant species that has been determined by our Parks and Wildlife Commission to pose a significant threat to the aquatic resources or water infrastructure of our state. I'll talk more about this later, so I'm not going to get into all of the various species, but these are the species that are considered prohibited per our Parks and Wildlife ANS regulations. Again, I'll talk about some of these at great lengths later today. Really, zebra and quagga mussels are the poster children for our program, the most costly invasive species we have out there. So we're just trying to stop them from getting here in the first place. The ANS Act does also have a reporting requirement. Essentially what this law says is that any person who knows or suspects that ANS is present must report that to our program. We have a dedicated sampling and monitoring <laughs> team that will follow up on any reports that we receive. There are three primary pathways for reporting. One, you can send that directly to our program office at that invasive.species at state.co.us address. You can call our program office at 303-291-7295, or you can visit CPW's website where we have a report and invader form. Any information you enter there is going to be sent off to our email and we will follow up on any report that we do receive. All right, so some more legal authorities. So again, the State ANS Act provide us authority for authorized agents. Again, this is just our legal term for boat inspectors. Our boat inspectors have very specific authorities. They have the authority to temporarily stop and detain a conveyance. In our world, a conveyance is typically a recreational watercraft. Then we can inspect that conveyance for ANS. And beyond that, 
that's really it. We can recommend decontamination if an operator is compliant. We can conduct that decontamination if the operator is compliant. If they are not compliant, that doesn't mean they're just going to get away from us. It's at that point that we look to our qualified peace officers or our post-certified officers. They have more authority than I do as an authorized agent. They have the authority to order a decontamination. So if somebody doesn't voluntarily comply with me, then we call out a post-certified peace officer to order that decontamination. They also have the authority to impound or essentially take possession of a foul vessel. We also have what we refer to as authorized locations. An authorized location is just a location that has been authorized by CPW to inspect and decontaminate conveyances. Once one of these places has been determined to be an authorized location, it is mandatory that many vessels are inspected prior to entering these waters. This is not a voluntary program here in Colorado. We have very specific um, regulatory requirements. All right, so that's a lot of the Title 33 or statutory laws that apply to our program. We also have very specific regulations within mm -hmm. Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Our aquatic nuisance species regulations are covered in Chapter P08, which is specific to our aquatic nuisance species program. These regulations require that all persons that are going to be performing any sort of watercraft inspections here in the state go through our mandatory training program. That's a 16 hour training program to make sure that we have consistent implementation of our protocols. We also have our prohibited species list again mandate watercraft inspection and decontamination. We do have exemptions in place for vessels that are both hand launched and human powered as they present a lower biological risk. And last but not least, our regulations really provide the guidance or the guidelines by which we implement the three primary portions of our program, which are sampling and monitoring, watercraft inspection and decontamination, and the most important part, education. Our regulations also provide very specific requirements for boat owners or boat operators here in the state of Colorado. Boat operators are required to clean, drain, and dry their boats in between each and every launch. Clean, drain, and dry boats help us to ensure that we're not transporting any nuisance species. We have requirements in place for things such as drain plugs to be removed prior to transport, the removal of aquatic vegetation, and we do also have a requirement for anybody that is registering a motorized vessel here in the state of Colorado to purchase an ANS stamp. This is essentially a product that is purchased at the time of registration. That stamp costs $25 for Colorado residents and $50 for non-residents. That generates approximately $2 million in revenue, which as I mentioned, is a pretty small piece of the pie when we're looking at a $7 million program. Uh, we do also have an aquatic nuisance species management plan. It took over 12 years for us to actually get this plan written and approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Again, this is very much a partnership effort. This is really the outline and the guidance book for how we're gonna implement this program on the ground. So again, we have three primary components, WID, which is watercraft inspection and decontamination. Again, we have mandatory inspection requirements here in Colorado. So residents must have their boat inspected if they've launched in a water outside of the state. So if somebody from Denver takes their boat to, I don't know, Nebraska, they have to have it inspected when they return. If they are leaving a location that is positive for one of our prohibited species, they must have it inspected when they leave. And if they are entering a location where inspections are required, there is a secondary requirement for out of state boats. That's a person that is visiting the state of Colorado. All out of state boats must be inspected prior to entering any water here in the state. <clears throat> This is a crazy table. I'm not gonna to dive too much into that. All that that is trying to tell you is that we have a lot of inspection stations. We have 75 inspection locations across the state. The vast majority of those are operated by Colorado Parks and Wildlife, but we have municipalities, counties, the National Park Service, as well as private industry that are helping us implement this program on the ground. This is just a map that shows you what all of those inspection stations look like. Really the goal of the program is to have um, inspection stations all across the state, corner to corner. This provides us the highest level of protection and also makes it as easy as possible for boaters to comply with these mandatory requirements. 
Oh, we do a lot of inspections. So Colorado each and every year goes head to head with the great state of Minnesota for who is going to implement the largest inspection and decontamination program in the nation. 2022, I'm a little bit sad. They edged us out just a little bit. I'm not that sad. They have way more water than we do. So the fact that we're inspecting close to 450,000 boats here in the state of Colorado each and every year is pretty awesome. We also decontaminate an incredible amount of vessels, just so you are aware. A decontamination in our world does not involve any soaps, bleaches, chemicals, anything like that. We are strictly using hot water to reduce the biological risk prior to allowing people to launch. The vast majority of decontaminations that we perform is just to address the risk of standing water on someone's vessel. Even a small amount of water has the potential to be transporting all sorts of different aquatic organisms. So any water that's found on a boat has to be removed or decontaminated prior to allowing launch. So in, let's see, 2021, our state legislature passed House Bill 211226, which was titled More Robust Aquatic Nuisance Species Check Stations. What this bill did is it provided CPW the authority to implement inspections and decontaminations at roadside locations, places such as ports of entry and welcome centers. The idea behind this program is really to stop those vessels and reduce the risk before they ever make it into the interior of our state, um, which is a really, really effective supplement to our existing ramp-based decontamination program. 2022 was the first year of that pilot program. In 2022 alone, we were out there at the Loma Port of Entry on I-70 for three days. Over the course of three days, we intercepted 26 muscle fowl boats at that one port of entry, which is pretty outstanding. In 2023, we have expanded to several other ports of entry around the state. We just did one at the Trinidad Port of Entry last Friday. We intercepted a huge boat coming in from Texas that was just covered in zebra mussels. So really, really important that we're checking these things before they ever make it into our interior. All right, enough about boat inspections, sampling and monitoring. So CPW really focuses our sampling and monitoring efforts on early detection. Early detection for us is really focused on the early detection of zebra and quagga mussels. We wanna find them at their earliest stages in the invasion. So we have the opportunity to contain them or stop them from spreading into new locations. We have different sampling techniques that target different life stages of zebra and quagga mussels. Our primary form of sampling is what's referred to as a plankton toe. Uh, for those here in the room, this awesome gentleman here is performing a plankton tow. This is essentially running a fine mesh net through the water. We collect and then condense all of the plankton. And then this awesome gentleman over here, Mr. Spencer, has the great pleasure of sitting in our aquatic nuisance species laboratory and looking at plankton samples all day. Thank you, Spencer. Um, what Spencer is looking for at that point is what we refer to as the muscle villager, which is the larval or planktonic life stage of a zebra quagga mussel. Then we do substrate checks. That's essentially suspending pieces of PVC on the reservoir. Every time we go out there, we pull those up and take a look at them to see if anything is settling or becoming attached. And then we do shoreline surveys. That's walking around, flipping rocks, looking at docks, looking at any sort of infrastructure that may be out there on the shoreline. At that point, we're really looking for the adult stage of the mussel. We also do stream surveys, crayfish trapping, and plant inventories as our time and resources allow, but zebra and quagga mussels, are, again, are really the most costly invasive that we're aware of, so that's where the vast majority of our efforts go to. We are pretty aggressive with our sampling here in Colorado. We base our sampling frequency on what we term as the risk. The risk has two components to it. First, we have the risk of introduction. That's essentially boating pressure. The more boating pressure we have, the more likely it is that something will be introduced. And then secondarily, we have partnered with the Department of Public Health and Environment to do a habitat suitability assessment to determine which waters here in the state are the most suitable habitat for zebra and quagga mussels. We look at those two things in tandem. The higher the risk, the more we get out there and sample. Our highest risk waters we sample about once every three to four weeks during the summer season. Last but not least, priority number one, education. 
we can't be out there all the time. There's all sorts of water using demographics that we don't get to talk to each and every day. So we try to come up with all sorts of different methods by which to communicate with those different users of the waters here in the state. We have handouts, brochures, rec, rec cards, guidebooks, specific user resources, things like boot brushes, waiter cleaning stations, gear cleaning stations. And one really cool thing that we have been working on recently is partnering with the Invasive Species Action Network out of Billings, Montana, on a program that they refer to as Don't Let It Loose. Don't Let It Loose is a program that really tries to promote responsible pet ownership here in the state of Colorado. <laughs> Again, this is a program that's really run by Invasive Species Action Network, but is fully funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, really, really trying to keep those aquarium and garden sorts of species from being introduced into the wild. In the last year or so, we've really taken a pretty aggressive stance on this. There are three different elements to this program. First, we are partnering with locally owned exotic pet stores. We have 23 partner pet stores here in the state of Colorado. They help us to educate their customers, but also provide rehoming service ser services for exotic pets. We are trying to work with our education department to come up with lesson plans for elementary educators that will be launched um, this upcoming fall. And then here's where some of you awesome folks could help is that we are actually working on well, we have designed some of these really cool signs. Um, we're trying to find places to actually get these posted out there in the wild. We're not really looking at large lakes and reservoirs. It's really neighborhood ponds that are the highest probability of having something like this introduced from an aquarium dumping. So if you have any places or that you think this might be a good place to post some of that signage, please do feel free to reach out. We'll provide all the signs you want free of charge. So just let us know. These are just a few pictures of what this actually looks like out there on the ground. And at this point, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to my friend Emily, unless there's any questions. Um, I think one of the reasons that this partnership works so well uh, is because, well, you don't do much with terrestrial species. That's really our focus. We do have aquatic species that are listed, but it's more uh, I don't know, to get, it, to get it out, to get more eyes on it for education. As far as the work that we actually do, it's primarily with um, terrestrial species. Because we are getting a laws and regs credit, I apologize if you are very, very familiar with noxious weed law. My next presentation will be way more interesting, but this one is all about our noxious weed laws and regs. It's an introduction to the list and then also goes over the responsibilities of local governments because those are the types of questions that I get from both the public and local governments more than uh, any other questions pretty much. Um, so again, quick overview. I'm gonna go over the goals of our program. I'm gonna talk about the act versus the rule, the role of local governments, and then um, specifically with the list go over the 2023 updates. Uh, they're not really aquatic specific, but in case you are not familiar with the updates that were made in May, you will be after this talk. Uh, so our goals basically are different for different species, depending on how widely distributed they are throughout the state. So we have species on our list A that are not yet known in the state, making them pretty high priority. If we do find them, again, looking at uh, that early detection type of work. Um, Species with isolated or limited populations, we are looking um, to eliminate those if possible. Um, you know, it obviously depends on how widely distributed they are, but if we have populations, just a handful of populations throughout the state, those are some of our higher priority species. Um, and then finally, uh, our list C is basically to provide resources to contain and manage those species and perhaps um, manage them in certain situations where maybe restoration or like building wildlife habitat is the goal. Um, so to do that, we coordinate uh, efforts of noxious weed managers and local municipalities through both le legislation and um, just like communication. Um, we provide funding through grants, through the noxious weed program, federal funding, that sort of thing. Um, I run a seasonal field crew. I got Sarah and Carly in the front row here worked with a handful of you guys this year already. Um, the noxious weed uh, law is an unfunded mandate, so that's one thing that we kind of offer. Um, if you are short on resources or staff, we are able to assist. 
Uh, we do education and outreach, and then we also maintain close contact with the neighboring states because if they uh, are having issues with species that potentially could end up here, we're going to have an issue with them. Or we would if we weren't keeping an eye on it. <laughs> Um, so two basically different pieces of legislation that work together uh, to define the noxious weed law in the state of Colorado. Um, one, we've got our act, which is the Colorado revised statutes. Basically that document is, I mean, it, it can be changed, but it's not frequently updated. It is gonna define the role of local governments, commissioners, land owners, and then generally outline our list A, B, and C versus our rules updated every two years. Specifically, we have a rotation schedule for our list B. Um, those are species that vary on the county level as, as to what their management plans look like. Um, and I can kind of go over, I'll talk about the list B management plans in just a second here. Um, <laughs> This is a lot of text, I apologize, but it's straight out of the act and it's important. Um, so per the act, local governing agencies are required um, to be compliant with the law to adopt, administer, and update a noxious weed management plan, uh, appoint a local advisor or advisory board um, to inform decisions on the local level, uh, actively work towards eradicating list A and locally elevated list B. So it's a situation where if you have list A species, like it's not like, oh, you're not compliant because you have list A species, like everybody's got list A species. But as long as you are actively um, making an effort to treat them, then you're good. Um, you got to directly or indirectly manage your public right of ways. And then uh, last thing, anybody who gets a grant from the CDA for a weed fund, uh, you got to be compliant. So you got to hit those four check marks in order to receive funding. Um, I get a lot of questions. Sometimes public landowners will reach out to um, cities and counties. Uh, they'll be like, oh, I've got weeds or my neighbor has weeds. It is the responsibility of each landowner to manage weeds on their own properties. However, uh, the state does delegate the responsibility to either um, start the enforcement process or provide assistance. Like there's a lot of ways that we can go about it, but at the local government level, um, you're, you're gonna kind of be pushing that management, right? Um, so we also delegate, um, I guess, the ability to elevate species. So if you, let's say I've got my little tiny town, that's Emilyville, and I'm like, we're gonna treat every species in my natural areas. And that is what our, our code says. Um, we are able to enforce on private landowners as long as we are, uh, are holding that same standard. Um, so basically we've got our state plans that is like the baseline for management. Local governments are able to make those a little bit more strict if they choose to. Uh, as far as the list, I think most people are probably familiar with the list, but I'll go over them real quick here. So list A, these are species that are designated for statewide eradication um, or prevention if they're not yet present in the state. Our list B, these plans vary on the county level. So it's either countywide elimination, countywide suppression, or in some counties we have containment areas. So within that containment area, you're going to eliminate, or excuse me, suppress, and then outside of the containment area, you're gonna eliminate. Uh, list C species, this is more, um, we provide education and we provide resources in order to manage these species, but they are a lower priority just because of how prevalent they are throughout the state. Uh, it's, it would be not financially feasible for us to be like, you, you gotta manage these too, right? We recognize that there's limited resources. Um, and again, those that might be species that if they're locally not very um, widespread or if they're high priority for another reason, um, counties can elevate those list species. We also have the watch list, um, it's unregulated. But basically the point of that is just keep an eye out. We're not sure exactly what the impacts of these species will be. We know that they're um, either in the state or have the potential to be introduced in the state. Um, and if you see them, I, I mean, it, it definitely varies on the county level. Some counties treat them like a list day. Some counties are like, yeah, we're keeping an eye on them. You know, we're watching them. Um, but basically the goal is just to gather a little bit more information on their distribution and potential impacts. Uh, more or less, the lists are going to follow this invasion curve with our list A species being less widely distributed throughout the state um, and introduced more recently 
versus our listy species, which are going to be more widely distributed and may have been around for, for quite a while. Um, another thing that can impact our listing decision is impacts to um, important resources uh, such as water. So uh, we'll, we'll circle back to that for sure. Um, so list A, we got circles around our aquatic species. Um, Rob and I are both going to go into specific species and idea a little bit later. So this is just kind of to get an idea of where these species fall on the lists. Uh, in our fewer than 10, so these are all list A, and I got more list A on the next slide, but fewer than 10 populations at Flower and Rush, currently actually not known in the state, but we did have a population in 2017 that has not returned. Um, let's hope that it doesn't, but it's still a good one to, to recognize and keep an eye out for. Um, and then really the focus of my identification presentation later is going to be purple luster, peri willow herb, uh, and yellow flag iris, which it was the new addition to our list A uh, this year. List B, uh, our only aquatic that we're going to talk about is Eurasian water milfoil. And Rob's got plenty to say about that, I am sure. Um, one thing to know about this list B species, in 2026, we are going to be updating our county management plans for Eurasian water milfoil. So if you have data, I'm sure we will be in contact at that point. Um, that, that is, the more, the more information we have about the distribution um, throughout the state, the better the better management decisions we can make. So if you do have data to contribute, um, I will talk about advanced mapping um, also later. Um, so again, those list B management plans vary from county to county. They're determined by distribution data and also just conversations with county weed managers and people who are doing work on the ground. Um, and for our list B uh, species, use of biocontrol. Um, is encouraged uh, with our list A species, even if there are biocontrols that are available because, um, because biocontrols are never going to result in a full eradication of a population. We, are, we do not encourage uh, use of biocontrols for, for list A species because you're not going to be eliminating, uh, you're gonna be, it's suppression basically. Um, again, we're going to be updating that list B management plan for Eurasian water milfoil in 2026. And then list C, main thing to know here is in 2023, we added Siberian elm and tree of heaven to our list C. So it's not going to be like, okay, everybody get out there and remove all of these, um, these woodies. Um, more of a, a no replant, you know what I mean? We're not encouraging these species by having them listed. It's just gonna kind of steer people in other directions, hopefully. And that's them, if you're not familiar with them. Finally, we've got our watch list. So basically our listing process, species off the watch list, uh, we gather data on them and then eventually they can be elevated to other lists. So as you can see, Siberian elm tree of heaven and yellow flag iris were all previously watch list species. The way that species get onto the watch list is through uh, basically people bringing our attention to that, the fact that they are issues. So we have a plants of concern form where if you shoot, up, shoot us an email, sometimes I'll just add stuff to our plants of concern form. Um, but it's a Google Doc. So if you have got a species that you were concerned about um, that's not currently on the watch list or any of the lists, definitely go ahead and make a uh, raw record on that form. Um, and finally, to replace those watch list species that were elevated to higher lists, these are the three watch list additions. They're not aquatic species, but just to be aware of the updates that happened this year, we've got perennial sweet pea, tall oak grass, and yellow mignonette. Um, so if these are species that you have locally, definitely keep an eye on them, report them to add maps. Um, and potentially, we'll, I don't know, we'll see what we learn about them while, while the species is listed on the watch list. Um, and potentially, there there gets bumped up or gets bumped down. Um, and that is all I got for laws and regs. So, um, how are we doing on time? Incredible. 11 minutes. We, don't, well, we have four minutes left. Um, if anyone has a question, I could take a question now. Otherwise, Ashley, if you've got your PowerPoint, we can go ahead and get that. Mm -hmm. 
Is this like the updated list? So the books that I have here, they are doing a reprint, so it is not the updated list. So it's not going to have yellow flag iris in it or those two additional listies. But there's no species in it that are not listed. It's just missing a couple. Okay. That's a great question. I know we were. Um, all right, so um, thanks to Emily and Robert for inviting me here. Um, my name is Ashley Russ and I work with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm a water quality specialist there. Um, and one of my many jobs is to keep an eye on is to help our staff monitor for toxic algal blooms, which are really having a moment right now. So if you see the news lately, they're just all over the state making lots of press, which is, um, I appreciate any podium and chance to educate people because even though they've been around for a millennia, they are, um, it's a newer issue for people to kind of encounter and deal with. And um, I'm determined to keep people and pets safe. So any chance I can talk, um, I will. So I'll also warn you, I used to be a professor, so I love a podium and can talk forever. <laughs> so uh, keep an eye on the time if I keep going, but I've got it pretty well timed to 20, I think. Um, but yes, they've been making headlines everywhere, noxious algal, uh, not noxious weeds, but harmful algal blooms or toxic algae or cyanobacteria. Those are all the three same things um, that we're dealing with. Uh, the species is cyanobacteria, um, but I'll first talk about why uh, we care. And this comes from our, this is our, my wordiest slide because it comes from our um, administrative directive that uh, directs staff that it is a responsibility of staff to be monitoring this. And we've had this in place for about five years. Um, so we ask that all our uh, parks and wildlife will monitor and inform the public about cyanotoxin risk in highly recreated lakes. And we're monitoring 44 state parks and 35 state wildlife areas that have water on them. Um, and the, the, because that number of properties uh, there, the risk to users can't be completely el eliminated. So that's where more eyes on the ground, more education helps keep people safe. Um, and a lot of our properties are really remote and we only have staff you know, up there every couple weeks or maybe once a month. Uh, so it's up to our staff, our on the ground staff to monitor and sample the cyanobacteria blooms in highly recreated lakes that are managed by CPW from May through September. So people may observe a uh, bloom on a forest service property or a municipal property that uh, inquiry may come through me and I will help them, but it's really we're managing our properties and then we'll alert the forest service or alert the city. Um, but really the health department, this, this falls under their umbrella and we all partner with the health, the Department of Public Health and Environment to monitor for these things. Um, they're really handling most of the inquiries. So I'm going to just brief you on what are algae, what are algal toxins, how to detect the presence of algal toxins, um, what benthic toxic algae are in streams and ditches. That's kind of our up and coming new issue that I love any, you know, anybody who's out in the field to be keeping an eye out for. Um, and then our ongoing efforts to manage algal toxins. So I'm going to walk you through kind of the background of what these organisms are and then talk to you about how we do our monitoring program. So algae is like a generic term. It's to you all, it's like saying the term plants. I mean, it it's includes a lot of phylogenetic species and, and lots of different branches on the taxonomic tree. Um, so uh, algae is a generic term and that can include things like uh, plankton and diatoms and green algae and duckweeds, things that are plants um, that aren't really, I mean, they fall under the algae category, but things that are benign and not producing toxins. So just because it's green and gross in the water doesn't mean it's toxic and scary. We have a lot of green and gross things that can be nuisance to people who are fishing and gets hung up on their lures or whatever. They want a clean lake. But honestly, some of these plants, can, well, all of these plants compete with the cyanobacteria algae for nutrients. So having these in your lake is not a bad thing because they'll prevent um, a toxic algae bloom. Uh, and that then you can't get in the water at all if you have a toxic algae bloom. So what I'm concerned about 
out is not all the green algae and diatoms and all the kind of other stuff that may make your lake look gross, but I am concerned with the cyanobacteria. Again, they are an ancient organism. They were one of the earliest organisms to do photosynthesis, responsible for oxygen in our atmosphere, and they are on every continent. Um, they can be planktonic, meaning free floating, like in lakes and reservoirs, or they can be benthic and attached to something like the, the um, substrate of a river. Um, some species are capable of producing toxins. They're single cell, really simplistic organisms. However, they're highly evolved and that's why they've survived so long. And toxin production is one of their evolutionary traits. We're not really sure why in the academic world, not really sure why they do this. Probably a defense against herbivory. You guys know more about plants and poison, poisonous plants. They probably kind of same questions, probably to keep from being eaten. Um, their optimal growth rate is at higher water temperatures. So we've had a really dead season with all this rain on the front range and cool temperatures. And the minute it got warm, things bloomed. So they need the warm water, they need long sunny days. And all of that rain washed a lot of nutrients in from the watershed, fertilizer, stuff that just sits on the landscape, um, pet waste and, and, and cattle waste. Um, into that lake, so just primed it up for growth once it got warm. So uh, they have a, a season when it's warm and hot and sunny, they will grow. Um, they can even grow under the ice. Um, they are able to uh, outcompete other algae at high nutrient concentrations. So again, they are a really highly evolved uh, organism and they um, are great at existing anywhere. One of the neatest uh, Evolutionary traits they have are these aerotopes, this gas vacuole that you're seeing in the middle of the screen, and that allows them to um, regulate their buoyancy. Most other like generic term algae and plants in the water, if a wind event happens or a storm happens and the lake stirs up, the algae may get knocked down and away from sunlight, it will die. But cyanobacteria has these aerotopes that allow them after the storm is over, they slowly float to the top and get back to the sunlight. So they have all these amazing traits that have allowed them to exist and really be prevalent. What we're concerned about um, is the toxins that they produce. It's not so much that the cyanobacteria are out there, it's that they can turn on toxin production and they can turn it on and off and it's really unpredictable. You can have a small bloom with no toxins and you can have a big bloom, uh, I mean, sorry, you can have a small bloom that's very toxic or a big bloom with no toxins. There's no real um, pattern. But the main toxins they produce are these microcystins, lindospermopsin, anatoxin, and saxitoxin. Uh, starting at the bottom, saxitoxins we don't test for in Colorado. That's primarily um, associated with marine organisms of cyanobacteria. You might hear about um, oysters or mussels, um, things that are in Chesapeake Bay has an issue more with saxitoxins. Um, but we are on the lookout for the other three. Any toxic algae that we encounter is capable of producing, or the ones that are capable of toxic production, they're always capable of microcystins. So that's the main thing we're looking for. <laughs> Just got the slowdown <laughs> signal. So <laughs> microcystins are able, when an algae can produce toxin, they, it's always microcystin. So that's the first screening that we do and the most common toxin we encounter. Uh, when they produce microcystin, they may also produce cylindrospermopsin or the anatoxin. So we're looking out for these. They can attack different parts of the human body or animal body. They can be um, kidney and liver or hepatoxins, or they can be neurotoxins. Um, so that uh, you, you can have a wide variety of symptoms when you encounter um, the toxin. As I mentioned, production of the toxin is unpredictable. One day the bloom that you're looking at is fine. We test it for toxin, there's nothing. The next day it can be highly toxic. So we have to mitigate um, against that risk. Um, toxic species have both toxic and non-toxic strains. So just by identifying the species under a microscope won't tell me if it's toxic or not. I just know that it, this is a species that can or cannot produce toxins. Um, and they're generally, uh, they don't produce toxins all the time. 
and they're generally produced in that warm, stagnant, nutrient-rich water. So we do tend to see them more on the front range below point source pollution, like wastewater treatment plants. Um, and so we, the, our urban lakes and front range lakes tend to have more blooms, but right now they are in every quadrant of the state in some high headwaters that um, don't have any pollution sources above them. Um, so it's again, not really predictable. Um, how do we know if there's been a toxin event? Well, uh, you may at first and foremost, we get reports of dog fatalities. I haven't had a dog die on my watch yet, but they do, that's not in our properties, but um, it has happened. It, ha it happened in uh, Lakewood last year. There was a dog. Um, livestock fatalities, uh, that is uh, livestock have high value. And so when they encounter uh, toxic algae, that can be um, a, a very expensive loss and people are aware of them. Whereas wildlife fatalities probably go unnoticed unless they die right on the beach shore, which we've had geese do. Um, then you know, you can say that's the algal toxin. If they go die in the woods, we don't know um, what's going on. So it goes underreported. Uh, we know that livestock and dogs preferentially drink from um, algal cyanobacterial waters. Um, they've done tests with cattle, giving them clean water and cyanobacterial water, and they prefer the grosser water. And we've all seen our dogs drink out of the grossest stuff, so you can't trust their judgment. Um, so they, it's, they were worried about any lakes and reservoirs that provide water to downstream irrigators that they may water their livestock with it. So we make sure if there's a bloom that we're communicating out so people can make their own decisions. Symptoms, um, nausea and vomiting is the most common uh, after encountering and swimming in the water. Uh, diarrhea, skin or throat irritation like this rash here. Um, allergic reactions, difficulty breathing, if it's a dog, they may have seizures, they may start foaming at the mouth, and their reaction's pretty quick. It's within the hour. Um, with humans, it can be delayed more, um, but you will know. Uh, where have we detected cyanotoxins? This is from a map I'll show you the link to later, but it's on the Public Health Department site. If you just Google toxic algae in Colorado, you would land on their site. Um, and they. We have a map of current conditions and historic conditions. So this is our historic conditions of all the places that we have observed. Um, so any orange dot, there has been an algal bloom. So it's pretty much all over the place. Um, and then there's uh, other places, like up in Steamboat, there's some lakes that have constant cyanobacteria blooms but have never been toxic. Um, so there's blooms everywhere, but not necessarily toxins everywhere. These are all the toxic blooms. Um, but in uh, these are kind of my common offenders. Is these are my like the people I talk to the most are at these parks and wildlife areas, and they're all having blooms right now. Um, so planktonic cyanobacteria, that's the free floating toxic algae. I just told you that it can cause a skin rash or skin irritation. So this is a picture we grabbed off the web. This is not anybody on our staff, um, but you wouldn't want to put your hands in a bloom, even if you didn't know it, it might not be toxic. Um, so we provide uh, just rubber, not on, you know, gloves to our people, those disposable gloves for people to take samples so that they don't do this and don't encounter any toxins um, before we were able to test. Um, but it can look like green paint. Um, so it may just discolor the water it can look like grass clippings. This is the species that's most common and that we have in most of our reservoirs right now. If a bloom is happening, it's mostly this species right now. Um, it seems to be like an early season offender and it's not generally toxic, but a few places it is toxic right now. Um, it can look like uh, bright green clumps you see out in the water. This is out at Bar Lake and they, um, just uh, notified me that uh, they are having a toxic bloom right now. And I just took a sample to the lab. So uh, they are put their beach and, and water contact sports are closed right now as of just a day ago. Um, but this is what it looks like when they have a bloom. It can also turn 
this turquoise, this blue-green turquoise color, and that's where blue-green algae gets its name. That's referring to cyanobacteria. That's a street name for cyanobacteria, but it comes, the color may not appear until it starts to die. So it's not typically this color until some of the bloom is dying off. And so it's usually the brighter green looking stuff until it dies. And when it dies, the cells are lysing or, or splitting open and, and deteriorating. And that's when the toxins are really released. Even if it hadn't been a toxic bloom before, that moment that it's dying, it's likely to be toxic. Uh, we also are concerned about benthic cyanobacteria. We are not, we're looking for it, but it's not a requirement of our field staff to be monitoring for it. I'm just trying to get the word out because it's clearly been a problem in our uh, neighboring state. Uh, it forms these mats on the river bottom. It can look a lot like Diddy Mower, that diatom on the bottom, but it's got a more distinctive kind of carpet-like appearance, more of like a fabric look to it. Um, and it will grow on slow moving streams. A fast moving river would scour it and displace it, but a slow moving stream on the bottom of the sand or the cobble or the bedrock, and even on aquatic plants, it spreads laterally across the stream, like a kind of a carpet or a blanket, and can get thicker and kind of build upon itself. When the, it's disturbed, the mats can detach from the substrate and travel downstream or float on the surface of the water. We first became aware of this in 2020 because of a case out of Zion uh, National Park. Really sad story where on July 4th, a family is out recreating in Zion and uh, there's videos of a little boy playing with his dog in the water and within an hour, the dog's dead. Um, so they are not a or within 15 minutes. Um, the dog ate a clump that was floating um, and if I even have that on there video. Um, the kid is playing in the water and the dog's kind of chomping around and ate a clump of that benthic algae, but um, there was no uh, chance to even get it to care um, and they didn't know what they were dealing with and neither, the park staff wasn't aware of it. Um, but then uh, as of July 5th, they notify the park and this health watch was issued and now the National Park Service has become a real leader in looking for Benthic algae, they have tested all their rivers in the state of Utah um, in all their national parks, not all the rivers in the state of Utah, all the rivers in their national parks within the state of Utah. And the only place we found it in Colorado is where, uh, is where they tested it in a national park. So we just haven't started really um, testing for it, just looking for it. Um, but this is kind of what it looks, this is from the Zion incident where the toxin level was 500 greater than 550 micrograms per liter a closure is 15 micrograms per liter 15 grams is what we consider toxic to humans so it's very toxic um, and it was dominated by this microcolia species and as of late july or mid july the park has a meeting and alerts their whole staff they start going around looking for it cleaning it up and once park staff ends up cleaning out a ditch that had dry mats of benthic algae in it. And because of that, that staff member going in unprotected, didn't have a, any kind of mask on or gloves and um, ended up in the ER with lots of symptoms, initially nervous system uh, symptoms and long-term he has lost the hearing in one ear. Um, so it's no joke. And this is uh, dealing with dried material because he it was dusty and it was dried. He was respirating it. We normally worry about any, you, you get, you can get a skin rash, but you're going to get sick from it if you ingest it. So it has to enter your body. Um, so in that case, he was breathing it in. Um, generally, we worry about people swimming or young kids swimming and drinking the water accidentally. So very toxic stuff and very harmful to people. Just showing more pictures of what it looks like. It's kind of, it looks like a lot of other paraphyton on rocks. So it's hard to distinguish, um, but just want people looking for it. Um, again, we've had one report of this in Colorado and it was because it was on National Park Service property and they were looking for it. Um, it is present in Northern Colorado and that's where they were testing for it. Um, and the higher cell counts of other potentially toxic cyanobacteria have found, been found in southeastern Colorado. So 
we found it here and there, but um, don't quite have a grasp on how to monitor for it. Uh, our monitoring and program is all directed by this administrative directive that just directs staff how often to monitor, how to do it, when to sample, step-by-step -step instructions, um, a checklist to do out in the field, a visual guide, and then each of our state wildlife areas and state parks has different risk, um, different risk factors. So if it's a park that has had a bloom in the past, they are going to be monitoring more because once it's there, it's going to keep resurfacing each summer. Um, and so it's likely that they'll have a bloom again. If they've never had a bloom, then they just check once a month. And the first check is a visual inspection. So if you're seeing something, it's there. If the water looks clear and clean and there's just plant life there, it's not there. So we ask for a visual inspection first. I don't expect you to read this flow chart. This is just what we have like as a little one pager for staff of like, if, if then, um, flow chart, um, but we ask first to do the visual inspection. So the Cyan app is a, it's a website that is produced by the EPA and NOAA, and they are using remote sensing or satellites to detect cyanobacteria blooms. We can, it's not new to use remote sensing for plant life. Um, chlorophyll uh, is a signal that can be picked up in space. But cyanobacteria have one particular pigment called phycocyanin that can be picked up from space. So that can be an easy visual tool to do from my desktop remotely. And I can look and kind of look, I look for lakes that we manage and ping our managers if I'm seeing something. Um, they can also look from their desktop. Um, otherwise, if they are, see then we ask them to just do a visual check. Even if I see it on the website, I want them to go there and look, is it really there? Do some ground truthing, look, do a walk around the perimeter of the lake or drive or whatever, looking for it, particularly in marinas and swim beaches where people will come in contact. If they see something green and they're not sure what it is, we'd walk them through a jar and a stick test, which I'll show you in a second. If they believe, if it passes that test, then we do this strip test. I'll show you what one of those looks like. Um, and that's kind of like a 20 minute or 30 minute test that's a lot like doing an at home COVID test um, where you're just kind of mixing everything comes in a package and you're mixing stuff and you're looking for a line on the test strip. And if they are, if all of those things are positive, uh, then they send a sample to me and I'll either do the test strip or, um, but it'll go to the CDPHE lab and they'll analyze it for toxin concentrations. So this is what the web app looks like, Cyan. It's really cool use of remote sensing and need, um, and need to be able to look at, uh, look at this from space. You need a clear sunny day, you can't have clouds. It goes around, it's updated um, every 10 or 12 days and lakes have to be a good size. But <coughs> the view picture up from the remote sensing is about a 30 meter, I think it's 30 meters, but um, I think it gets better at even 300 meters. So it has to be a, a sizable um, area. And it's, it's not getting the fine detail that you can see on the ground. Um, but if it's a big bloom, it will pick it up. The stick test tells you if it's a plant or some other organism or cyanobacteria. So the toxic algae or cyanobacteria will coat a stick like paint but they will not hang off like hair, like filamentous algae, like on the right picture. So the one on the left is cyanobacteria, the one on the right is uh, filamentous algae, a different type of algae, maybe gross and nasty looking, but totally not toxic and fine to swim in. Uh, the jar test, you're taking advantage of that aerotope um, evolutionary trait that the bacteria has. So we ask our managers to, if they're not sure, they will uh, fill up any old clean, I mean, it doesn't have to be clean, but clear vessel. So it can be just a recycled jar um, and uh, scoop up the area where the algae is, shake it and disturb it, just like you're a windstorm in a lake, you shake, 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 set it down on a counter. And within, at least within the 24 hours, but I've seen it, it, it doesn't even take that long. It takes about an hour for things to settle out and it either sits on the bottom, in which case it's something else, or it floats to the top, in which case it's cyanobacteria. So that's the real telltale sign. If I'm not sure if I've encountered it, if I'm out and about, this is, I, I do the jar test. Um, 
Then if uh, we're pretty sure it's toxic or we're pretty sure it's the toxic algae species or cyanobacteria, then we'll do this test strip. And it's just a, you buy a kit and they come in a set of five or a set of 20 from this one company, everybody's using them. And the results pretty much line up with my lab results. So they, uh, but they, I'm only testing from zero to 10 because the closure rate is the, the closure threshold for this toxin is eight. So if it's above 10, it doesn't really matter for our immediate action, we're closing the lake, um, or if it's above eight, um, but either way we'll confirm that it's toxic with the CDPHE lab and that's the next step. Um, we cooperate, we collaborate with the CDPHE, they uh, set these thresholds and we follow them. Um, this eight micrograms per liter is what I'm looking for. If it's above that, the lake is closed to contact recreation. If it's below that, if it's zero or zero to seven, then it's a yellow caution lookout. It's here, it could get worse, it could get better. It's safe enough, you're not gonna get sick from it, but it could change any day. Um, so these yellow caution signs, what we ask people to post, um, our lake managers post these when they have detected the algae is present, even if it's not toxic, but the species is there. Uh, we, we post these signs at every entrance point to the park or to the recreation area and post them by boat um, ramps and swim beaches, any place that people will um, see the signs. And then these red danger signs, um, if it's closed, if it's above that eight threshold, then uh, we're closing it off and putting red signs in all the locations. Um, and then again, we share the, um, all of our data is public and uh, I report, we, I report it as soon as I get results um, on this, I'm reporting it out daily really, but I'm required to report it updated at least once a week. Um, and this map is updated live, um, but where people can only, it, it takes about a week between seeing it, testing for it, and getting lab results. Um, but if they see it and we're pretty sure it's there, the yellow signs go up until we get the test results. And we update this on this map, trying to direct the public to go there, but it's a new tool. Um, and the CDPHE handles most of the questions from the public. Um, and there's lots of historic data on this algae map. Um, so if anybody wanted to do, you know, do research or check out a pattern in their favorite lake, um, it's all up there. And this is what the map looks like um, for uh, currently. Uh, we have uh, four water bodies that are closed, eight water bodies that are under caution. Um, and then these third party water bodies, that could be a municipalities reporting in their data or the forest service is reporting in their data. Um, so these are all mostly CPW properties and a few third parties, but mostly CPW properties because we work so closely with the state. Um, and then there's my information and I'll just flash through just some pictures of what it looks like. This is Cherry Creek Reservoir, uh, Deweese Reservoir. So it can be that floating gunk. Um, you don't have to read the words necessarily, but the, in, this, in this case, it changed over time. It takes a long, sometimes it goes up and down um, in the toxin results, um, but it just looks like green, you know, green gunk. It usually accumulates on the shoreline in the bays that are more protected from wind. If there is uh, wind exposure, it's usually on the side, uh, you know, that the wind is blowing it into one bank. I don't know if that's the word or not my sailing. Um, but that is it. I'll just leave my contact information up there. Oops, up there. So I'll take any questions, but otherwise, please feel free to contact me if you see anything out there. I have a question for you. Yes, Robert. As these people are out there doing their weed management or whatever they're doing in waterways, what sort of precautions should they be taking if they encounter something like this? Well, that's a great question. So um, if you're in a waterway, um, if you're in a waterway and you're wading in it, I, um, if you were, you wouldn't want skin exposure. That's what, if you think it's there, then you want to be wearing gloves and wearing waders. You don't want to be wading in just your tennis shoes and shorts. Um, so you want to protect your skin. Um, and then if you also, again, if you think it's there and you are in contact with it, the first thing you want to do is rinse off with um, clean water. 
it doesn't have to be drinking water, but any source of clean water is better than the water with toxic algae. Same thing if your dog was to get in it. If you think your dog just swam in a bloom, then you want to wash your dog off right away because they will, not only will they drink the water, but then they're licking themselves clean. And that's usually where they get the heavier dose. Um, so rinsing off, staying clean. And then if you, um, just like you would wash your hands before you ate lunch out in the field, because you don't want E. coli, uh, same reason you don't want algal toxins either. But good questions. Otherwise, I don't, unless you're doing land work like that Zion National Park, who like if, if he was you know, raking up an old bloom, then I would wear a mask but that's pretty rare. All right, great. Thank you. For Thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So um, this presentation is really just going to focus on some of the actual species of concern, um, some control measures that CPW is engaged in, and really just give you some identification techniques to try to help us find some of these species or hopefully not. All right, so again, this is really focused on plants, but we do deal with a lot of aquatic animals in our program. So I just wanna to touch on our great friends, the zebra and quagga mussels. So zebra and quagga mussels, these are freshwater bivalve mollusks that have some specific characteristics that make them extremely detrimental. Like any invasive species, they are really, really aggressive reproducers. A single mussels can produce up to a million juvenile mussels in a single spawn. They attach with something called a bissel thread, which I kind of equate to like a root or an anchor that they actually use to attach themselves to solid surfaces. And they are a filter feeder. That sounds like a great thing, except for a single mussel can filter up to a liter of water per day. Um, they are filtering out the plankton and the nutrients in the water, which are the basis of our aquatic food web. So that is not a great thing when we have all of this water being filtered on a daily basis. There are three distinct life stages of zebra and quagga mussels. I mentioned that they have a planktonic or larval life stage. This is not something that you could see with the naked eye. It takes Spencer looking under a microscope to find again what we refer to as the Belliger. Belligers then begin to develop shells, settle out of the water column and attach to surfaces. At that point, we refer to them as settlers. They kind of feel like sandpaper on a substrate. And last but not least, they mature into adults, somewhat like us, as much as we don't want to. An adult muscle is only about the size of your thumbnail. This is just a map that shows you where in the world zebra and quagga mussels are here across the US. This is largely a problem in the eastern half of the country where they have completely inundated many of the major river systems. We haven't seen a ton of them out here in the western US. But what I want to bring to your attention is in September of 2022, we did have the first detection of an adult zebra mussel anywhere here in the state of Colorado. That was at High Line Lake out near Grand Junction. That was the first detection and back in September. Um, following that detection, we invested hundreds of man hours into trying to identify the extent of this population. What we found was approximately 20 adult mussels at different points within the reservoir, so very well distributed. And then we did also find a couple mussels immediately below the reservoir in what we refer to as Mac Wash. This is problematic for us as the water from Highline ultimately ends up in the Colorado River. We do not have zebra mussels anywhere in the Colorado River system, so we are trying to do everything we can to stop that from happening. So what we are, well, that doesn't look great with the light, but what we are trying to do out there at Highline, again, this is a control workshop. Um, so we are trying to eradicate zebra mussels from Highline Lake. A couple things about Highline Lake that make this a possibility. Highline Lake is relatively small. It's about 160 surface acres at full pool. And it is a reservoir that is used primarily for recreational purposes. It is the end of the Highline government canal system, which is the primary agricultural system out there in the Grand Junction area. They are not, um, they are not delivering water into that system from essentially November until April. So we had about a five month window where we were looking essentially at a stagnant pool of water, which is exactly what you need if you wanna to try to kill these things off. 
So we are looking at or have actually implemented a two, what I'll call two phase integrated pest management approach out there at Highline to try to eradicate this species. The first phase of that is that we actually implemented a drawdown of the reservoir. We drew this down from approximately 160 surface acres to, as you can see there, about 56 and a half. This is a reduction of approximately 80% of the total volume of the reservoir. Some of the reasons that we wanted to do that, one, we wanted to be able to observe what was out there on the shoreline to help us determine the true extent of the population. Interestingly enough, when we drew it down, we found no additional evidence of mussels, which was pretty cool to see. But more importantly, we wanted all the mussels that may be out there in the first 25 to 30 feet of the water to be exposed to freezing and drying conditions. Uh, we were very successful. We had several freeze and thaw cycles out there when the reservoir was drawn down. Uh, so that was relatively effective. Last but not least, we wanted to reduce the volume of molluscicide that we were going to have to apply to the reservoir. That was to reduce toxicity to the environment, but also, as I mentioned, downstream of Highline Lake, we have the Colorado River that is um, critical habitat for several threatened and endangered fish species. We did not want this molluscicide to end up in the river and exceed our aquatic life standards. So by drawing that down, that allowed us to significantly reduce the volume of molluscicide before it made it into that river system. Following that drawdown, you can see here that we did a very extensive bathymetric mapping effort out there. This was really, really important because we needed to know the volume of water that we were treating if we wanted to actually get the appropriate concentration of our product into the water. I didn't get to be part of this, but the pictures were pretty awesome. It was still iced over. They got out there with ice augers and all kinds of stuff um, to help us do this mapping, which was again, extremely valuable. Phase two is that we actually got out there and we applied a molluscicide to Highline Lake. The product that was chosen is a product called Earth Tech QZ. That's QZ for Quagga Zebra. This is an EPA registered copper based molluscicide. It has been used successfully in the eastern half of the US um, for this exact sort of application. We followed the label to a T. The label allowed us to treat um, half of the lake at a time with 14 days in between treatments. The goal out there was really to have the minimum effective concentration that would kill the mussels without killing everything else in the reservoir. This is a prized sport fishery out there in the Grand Junction area. So we wanted to kill the mussels, but not kill all of the fish. Um, we've talked extensively with folks from the East in terms of how we were gonna do this. We've talked to USGS. This is really the only eradication that has ever been attempted that involved both a drawdown and a chemical application. So we're really out there on the edge of what's known about this um, sorts of effort, uh, but we feel as confident as possible in what we've done to date. These are just a few pictures to show you what this sort of eradication effort looks like. This is March the 1st out there at Highline Lake. Man, we love those marshmallow suits because it kept us warm. Good times. Round two, a little bit nicer. That's before the rainstorm kicked in. Uh, there were a lot of shallow areas on the northern end of the reservoir that we couldn't access via boat. So we sent people out there with backpack sprayers to try to hit some of those mud flats. Rafts were used to try to hit some of the shallower sections. These are what we refer to as breakwaters. Those breakwaters have water in them to make sure that they are buoyant. We actually had to open up each and every one of those breakwaters and inject them with that EarthTech QZ using syringes. There was a ton that went into this. We wanted to make sure that no stone was left unturned. As I mentioned, a single muscle can produce up to a million juvenile muscles in a spawn. So even missing one of these things could completely derail this entire effort. Uh, the only thing I didn't mention here is we had the great pleasure of working with Ashley and our water team within CPW to figure out how in the world we're going to monitor the reservoir after this treatment. 
I'm no water quality expert. That's why we have awesome people like Ashley around. They helped us to come up with a really great sampling regime to make sure that we were monitoring not only the water quality, but also the copper concentrations within the reservoir. Overall, I would say this was very, very successful. We were able to maintain those concentrations we were looking for. We didn't see a ton of fish mortality. There was some, that's okay. We can restock some of those fish. Our primary objective was killing off the mussels. As I mentioned, this is pretty out there on the edge. We don't know if this was successful or not. We are really just in the beginning phases of the post-treatment monitoring. We are currently sampling Highline Lake each and every week. We have a technician out there at Highline whose entire job is to collect samples out there. They send them off to Spencer every single week. He looks at them the best that he can. We have also partnered with our aquatic animal health lab out in Brush, Colorado. They have developed an in-house PCR assay. We are splitting every single one of our plankton samples, sending half of that simple sample out to Brush for eDNA assessment. And then Spencer's looking at the other half of it under a microscope. So far, I am happy to say that we have not found anything conclusive out there that makes us think that mussels are still reproducing within the reservoir, which is awesome but that doesn't mean this was a success. In terms of what we would consider a success, we wanna have five years of negative testing following this chemical application before we feel any level of confidence that it was successful. Until that point, we are continuing to inspect and decontaminate every single boat that leaves Highline as they do present a risk of transferring these to other locations in the state. Crazy to be involved in a muscle control effort, not something I ever thought I would get to do. Crazy. All right, so now some other species for you to be aware of. The first is what we refer to as corbicula. A common name for this is Asian clams. These are not a prohibited species here in Colorado, but they are something that people very regularly confuse for zebra and quagga mussels, so I just want you to be aware. These are very widespread here in Colorado, so it's pretty likely you may encounter them. A few characteristics you can use to identify them include that they have these ridges or striations on the shell. If you actually take your fingernail and run it across there, you will feel those growth rings on the shell. Zebra and quagga mussels have a nice smooth shell. They also do not have those bissel threads, so they're typically going to be found sitting on the shoreline or in the mud or the benthic area in our lakes and reservoirs. They're not attaching themselves to surfaces. This is still a nuisance species. It's not prohibited per our regulations, but something that we try to keep an eye on. So if you come across them, please do let us know. This is just a side-by-side -side comparison, again, to the untrained eye. We get numerous reports each and every year that there are zebra mussels all over the place and we don't know what in the world we're doing. I will tell you 99% of the time it is one of these corbicula. So it's those eyes on the ground. It's really important that you can distinguish these species. All right, I'm only going to cover one more animal and then we can talk about plants. This is the New Zealand mud snail. The New Zealand mud snail was first found here in Colorado back in 2004. It is native to New Zealand, hence the name. We're pretty creative here. This is a small aquatic freshwater snail. It was first found in the U.S. in the 1980s in the Snake River in Idaho and the Madison River in Montana. It just so turns out that both of these locations are world-class fly fishing destinations. Um, it's believed that it was probably an angler that had traveled to New Zealand. The species can live out of the water for extended periods of time. They reproduce asexually, so if only one of them happened to make it back into the U.S. on their shoes, they went into the Snake River in Idaho. That could have started up this whole population that we have here in the U.S. If you want to identify one of these things, well, it's a little bit tricky. That's kind of our jobs. I don't even feel confident doing it. We send every suspect mud snail off for genetic verification if we do find that that is what it is. But some characteristics you would want to look for, a large mud snail is about an eighth inch in length, black to brown in color. They have five and a half spirals. Good luck seeing that when it is a tiny, tiny little thing. One thing you can look at is if you actually hold the tip of the mud snail up towards the sky, the opening is going to be on the right hand side. We refer to that as a right handed snail. The vast majority of our native snails have the opening on the left hand side. That's not 100%, but it at least gets you going in the right direction. They 
You also have something that we refer to as an operculum. I kind of an equate an operculum to a garage door on the shell. If they are taken out of the water, they shut down that operculum. If they get eaten by a fish, they shut down that operculum. This allows them to live out of the water for up to 30 days, even 50 days on a damp surface. Or if they get consumed by a fish, they can actually pass through the digestive tract of the fish unharmed. Fish swims downstream, poops out a mud snail, life is good, it only takes one to start up a whole new population, so they continue to move downstream via that fish pathway. This is kind of a sad map that shows us all the places that we have New Zealand mud snails here in the state of Colorado. They're pretty well distributed. Some of our major systems, they are very well known in the South Platte, 11 Mile, Spinney, all through Deckers, all the way down to Chatfield. Um, we've also found them in downtown. Uh, we also have them, oh, this is Fountain Creek down in Colorado Springs. This is the Arkansas River at its confluence with Badger Creek, which is a new population. This is the Green River and Dinosaur National Monument the Gunnison and Uncompahgre rivers out there on the western slope and kind of on accident we found them in the Colorado River last year when we were doing all of that um, muscle sampling on the Colorado. Most recently we did just detect them in the last month or so in Bear Creek at Layer of the Bear near Idledale. Um, so this is absolutely something that we are seeing pretty frequently around the front range. So I wanted to bring it to all of your attention. You are just as likely as we are to come in contact with these. So please do keep your eyes open. There was some discussion about decontaminating boats, things like that when it comes to algae. Even if you are out there treating weeds in a waterway, it's really, really important that you clean all of your gear off in between each and every waterway that you may encounter because you may not realize it. This may look like a rock or something on the bottom of your shoe and it could very well be something like a New Zealand mud snail. So you should be decontaminating or disinfecting your gear anytime you are moving between waters here in Colorado. All right, now we can talk about plants. So these are all of the plant species that are considered prohibited per Parks and Wildlife Chapter 8 regulations. You will quickly see which ones I am familiar with because we see them. The rest of them are kind of like the watch list, things that aren't here, but we know that if they did become introduced, they would be problematic. I have kind of lumped these into groups of things that have similar characteristics and also native species that can be a little bit tricky to differentiate. So first, I'm going to start with some of our native Elodias or Elodia. These are very, very common here in Colorado. We have two um, really common Elodia species. These are Elodia canadensis and Elodia natalia. They have whorls with three to six opal leaves. And an important thing to be aware of is that they have smooth or entire leaf margins. This is going to be one of the characteristics that helps us to differentiate it from some of the common invasives that look very similar. All right, so here's a African Elodia. This is not currently known anywhere in the US to the best of my knowledge, but it is something that we are concerned with because we think that it could establish itself in higher elevations like we have here in Colorado. Native to Southern Africa has very minute tooths on each one of those leaf margins. One thing that is a little bit different, most of our, well, all of our native Elodias have the leaves growing in whorls. That's not the case with this African Elodia. They have alternate leaves that kind of have that recurved um, appearance to them. Then we have Brazilian Elodia or Brazilian Egeria, as some folks call it. This is a species that is present here in Colorado. We have one known population that is currently be tr being treated. It's at a water treatment facility a little bit north of us here in Denver. Again, something that you can use to look at this is going to be that it has those margins that are slightly toothed under a magnifying glass. You really, really need a hand lens or a microscope to see some of these characteristics on all of these species. And then the fun one, I believe one of our list A species, the dreaded hydrilla. Wow. Again, we do not have hydrilla here in Colorado. It is very, very abundant, particularly in the southern US where it has been very, very prolific. In terms of identification on this, you can see those visibly serrated edges on the leaf. The most characteristic though of the hydrilla is that 
going to be that you have this kind of red line on the midrib, and there are also small conical bumps on that midrib. Those are going to be the defining characteristics of the hydrilla that would take it, um, make it easier to identify. Again, this is not here in Colorado. We hope to keep it that way. But again, if you see something, please do let us know. This is just kind of a summary table. Again, our native Elodia, entire or smooth leaf margins, no teeth. I'll just summarize all this and say, if you see any serrations or teeth on the edges of these leaves, that is something that you should be concerned with. Um, if you have concerns, want to have a sample looked at, please let us know. We will gladly take those in and look at them for you. If we can't figure it out, we have resources that can. So please, please let us know. All right, next up we have the water mill foils. So our water mill foils tend to be in whorls in terms of their leafing. We do have a native mill foil. This is a northern water mill foil or Myriophyllum sibiricum. Couple things about our native mill foil. One, it grows exceptionally well in a lot of locations. So people think that this is an invasive, but it's actually a really, really good native species that provides a ton of habitat. Some characteristics of our native milfoil include if you pick this up and out of the water, I describe it as rigid. Essentially, the leaves will maintain its shape even when it's taken out of the water. You also want to count <laughs> the amount of leaflet pairs. If it has, oh, let's say eight or less leaflet pairs, then that is typically going to be this native water milfoil. In comparison, we have the Eurasian water milfoil or Myriophyllum spicatum. Okay, so in terms of distinguishing our native water milfoil from the invasive water milfoil, one, if you pick it up and out of the water, the leaves tend to collapse. It's not as rigid, it doesn't have as strong of a vascular system. The leaflet pairs are going to be much higher counts, typically 12 to 13 or above is going to lead you towards that Eurasian water milfoil. And another thing to be aware of is this blunt tip at the end is also characteristic of the Eurasian. This stuff is pretty widespread here in Colorado, particularly on the front range. We have very well known populations from Fort Collins all the way down to Pueblo. And this is even, oh, this is Walsenburg down here. It's not very widespread on the Western slope. That being said, we do have known populations in the Rio Grande River as it runs through the city of Alamosa. And also this is Navajo Reservoir down in the far South state. We like to say that it's only on the New Mexico side of Navajo, so we can put that on New Mexico, but it's a shared body of water. So it's likely here in Colorado as well. Well, the only other thing I want to say about that, I'll go back just a little bit. So one really exciting thing that we have seen is we are actually seeing hybridization between the native and Eurasian water milfoil here in Colorado. This is very, very hard to distinguish out there in the field. The main thing that you would want to look at is if it's in kind of that nine to 12 leaflet pairs, then we would typically send that in for genetic testing to determine if that is the Eurasian, the native, or the hybrid of the two. All right, another milfoil species is parrot feather. Parrot feather is not currently known here to Colorado, which is a wonderful thing. This is a little bit different in how it grows. Our other milfoils are completely in the water. The parrot feather tends to be emergent, so it'll actually grow up and out of the water up to a foot. Um, you can see what this looks like here in the image. 20 to leaf, 20 to 30 leaflets per leaf. So a lot more leaflets than we're going to see on that Eurasian or our native uh, water milk foil. If I plug this in, you're not going to be able to click anymore. Okay, I can do the click here. We're cool. This is not a water milk foil, but is a species that regularly gets confused for one of our uh, invasive species. This is Kuma.
mountain tail. Again, this is a native. When you actually look at it closely, it is quite a bit different than our water milfoils. But the main thing that you would want to look at is we actually have this kind of forked um, leaf structure on there, which is a lot different um, than the leaflet pairs that we have on a milfoil. But again, kind of with the untrained eye, this is pretty easy to confuse. Oh, yes, here I am clicking after you just told me not to. <laughs> Don't Thanks. do that. <laughs> 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 All right, another species that is not currently known here in Colorado is giant salvinia. There are really not any native look-alike species that I am aware of. This is a free-floating fern type of plant. It does have these kind of lines of, I'll call it hairs there on the leaves themselves. Uh, this is native to South America. Again, it's not known here to Colorado, but if it was, absolutely could be devastating. This stuff, again, is pretty well established in the southern half of the U.S. Um, we have heard of it coming in as a contaminant in some of these species that are being imported into Colorado, such as crayfish. Um, so there is absolutely the potential that this stuff could be brought in. Here's another one. This is a species that is considered prohibited per our parks and wildlife regulations. It's not a listed species per the Department of Agriculture, but something that we are concerned with as it is a very, very common in the water garden industry, and that is water hyacinth. So water hyacinth is a free floating plant. Um, it has thick, glossy leaves that tend to be heart shaped. Um, when you look at this, the really distinguishing characteristic is going to be these purple flowers. The flowers tend to have six blue to purple petals with one yellow dot in them. These are really, really easy to identify when you see them out there in the world. Uh, this is a bit more of a temperate species, so I'm not sure that it would do very well over winter here in Colorado. That doesn't mean that it's not problematic, just so I think last year, correct me if I'm wrong here, Spencer, but we did identify a population of water hyacinth in a pond out in Delta. Just over the course of a couple months, this stuff presumably got dumped and had pretty much taken over the entire shoreline of that reservoir by the time that we got out there. Spencer and another member of our staff had the great pleasure of going out there and bagging all this stuff up. How many bags did you get by the end of the day, Spencer? Three to four three to four giant trash bags of this stuff just over the course of a couple months. So it absolutely can proliferate. Um, we really worry about this down in some of like the areas in the San Luis Valley where they have some of these like thermal features and things in the water that would allow this to potentially live even over winter. So it is absolutely something we're keeping an eye on. Habits. All right, last but not least, we do have one more prohibited species, which is yellow floating heart. There's not really a species that looks exactly like this here in Colorado. The most common parallel that I could draw would be to our Rocky Mountain pond lily. However, when you look at the flower structures on these two species, they are very, very different. As you can see there in the pictures, the Rocky Mountain pond lily has this cup-like yellow flower. That is not the case with the yellow floating heart. That has that more classic flower structure with the five petals with the fringed margins. This is not known here in Colorado, but again, something we are just keeping our eyes out for. And with that, I just want to bring back to your attention that there is a statutory requirement for people to report any of these species to us at Parks and Wildlife. Again, several ways that you can do that. I'm not going to get into those in detail, but if you see something, say something. We can't be out there at all these places. Again, I really think neighborhood ponds and things that CPW is not necessarily monitoring is some of the highest risk for some of these species to be introduced. You're the ones that are out there managing those sorts of waterways, so please let us know if you see something. And with that, I will take any questions, unless Emily tells me I can't. Um, Scott online has asked, with huge increase in popularity of individual watercraft, pedal boards, et cetera, how would CPW recommend communities to address those, those users and waters with little or no decontamination decontamination in place? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> um, yes, so I mentioned that CPW does not require inspections or decontaminations of vessels that are both hand launched and human powered. Um, there's many reasons for that, primarily being the fact that they don't tend to hold water, the motors themselves aren't actually transferring any water, and they don't stay on the water for extended periods of time. Low risk, 
does not mean no risk. There is absolutely risk associated with those. At the moment, we are working very closely with our education department. We are developing essentially instructional videos to help those different motorized users figure out how to actually clean their craft and the risk that those pose. We are also in the process of coming up with a series of rack cards to address those same sorts of user groups. And then if you don't wanna go any of those, please reach out. We do also have gear cleaning stations that CPW would be happy to donate to anybody to help provide a practice. All right, I have quite a few slides, but really this presentation focuses on the identification of three species. Somehow we moved through them pretty fast here. All right, so we already talked about Mm -hmm. That was a little echoey for a second. No, that was this thingy. <laughs> um, let's see. So we already went over our true aquatic species. As far as the uh, species in this presentation, I'm going to focus on purple, purple loosestrife, hairy willow urban flag iris, and then I'm also going to uh, do a slide or two on flowering rush and phragmites because that is a watchlist species, but kind of a special case. All right, uh, so right away with the identification of these species, I would say number one thing uh, that can kind of help us out in finding uh, new populations is being able to identify habitats in which they're likely to occur. So um, purple loose of carry willow herb and yellow flag iris uh, are all generally found in wetlands. Um, purple loose drape is an obligate wetland species. I'm gonna contradict myself on the next slide, but you know, we're going to find that in wetlands the majority of the time. Um, so this is a species that a lot of times can form dense monocultures if left unchecked. Uh, it's spread primarily through rhizomes, but also does produce seed. Um, and then those seeds and uh, rhizomes are able to be dispersed uh, through water. So after flood events, a lot of times we'll see spread. Uh, <laughs> You don't really see this as much anymore, maybe if in like ditches or, or things on private property, um, but if irrigated or watered enough, it can survive in ornamental settings. I think that at this point, we've been going after this species enough and the education is at the level where I hope that you won't see that, but if you do report it, but let somebody know. Um, as far as the floral characteristics here, we're looking at like a quote unquote normal flower. Um, so normal shaped petals originating from that center point. It's going to be a uh, inflorescence, so a stack of those flowers that blooms from the bottom up. Uh, and inflorescence, inflorescences can range inside from, you know, a couple inches to really huge ones, depending on how, um, how old the plant is. Um, you're looking at five to seven petals, uh, generally light pink to purple in color. Um, and I think that that's that. So another thing about this species is even though it has a square stem, it actually is not in the mint family. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Let's kind of circle back to that in a bit. Um, so mature plants, especially mature flowering plants, are going to be um, pretty straightforward to identify. Um, you know, you're going to be able to see this from blocks away. Um, and maybe not immediately be like, okay, I know that's purple loose but you're going to be able to see it from, from a, uh, a long distance away. Um, and that color should keep you in to check it out. Uh, when we're looking at especially dense monocultures uh, like this, consider your site history and your seed bank uh, when making management decisions, uh, and especially when choosing um, chemical and that sort of thing. So depending on the site environment, um, the age of the plants, that sort of thing. These plants can look vastly different from, from each other, which makes them kind of hard to identify. So, you know, seedling stage, maybe we're looking at just little guys versus mature plants that can get up to 12 feet. And just being aware of, of that variation, I think is important in being able to identify the blue stripe. Uh, seedlings, I think most people would agree that's like the hardest stage to identify these species. Uh, if you are new to finding and treating purple loose strife, I would say, even though it can be a little bit more work to wait for them to go into flower and then treat, you're going to be a lot more confident when you're making your treatments. Um, so you can kind of see in that photo there, uh, it's a purple loose strife seedling 
uh, on the right there. And then on the left, we've got just like a little smart weed. And once you see the flowers of the two, you'd be like, okay, yeah, those are very different plants. But when you're looking at seedlings, um, it's, it's not quite as cut and dry. I do also feel like a lot of times we'll see environments that have purple blue stripe with a lot of seedlings that do look pretty similar. Um, young plants, a lot of times they can appear kind of wiry. It might just be like a single stem flowering or not. Um, and especially when they're in dense cattails or other vegetation, they're looking for light and they get real, uh, real lanky. Um, Stem characteristics here. So purple loosestrife is always going to have that square stem, which is pretty, um, it, it's a good feature to use to identify it. But uh, we also know that mints, uh, most all uh, plants in the mint family are going to have that square stem. So kind of by a process of elimination, if you've got a plant with a square stem that you think might be purple loosestrife and you crush it and you smell and it smells minty, you're like, okay, great. Not purple loosestrife. This is a mint. Um, I've got a bunch of lookalikes that are coming. You might be like, why are you showing us so many plants that aren't purple loose strife? And it's kind of that process of elimination thing. The more confident we can feel identifying other plants, um, we, can, we can feel more confident that we are actually treating our target species. So uh, we are also gonna see little branches at those nodes where the leaves are attached and uh, more mature plants might be woody at the base. As far as the leaf venation here, uh, the leaves, um, basically the veins are not going to go all the way out to the margin of the leaf. They kind of meet up before that. Uh, we've been calling that like a little turtle shell. If that is like a, something that helps you remember. Uh, again, maybe, you know, there could be other species that have that similar sort of, sort of uh, venation. But by combining these different characteristics, um, that can help us to feel confident in our, in our ID. Um, and then again, so that underside of the leaf, you can see that those veins pretty clearly. Um, and then generally, leaves are going to be arranged in opposite pairs along the stem. And then the next one up is going to be, uh, you know, alternate. And then they just go up the stem like that. Um, occasionally, you'll see leaves in whorls, like three leaves coming from the same place on the stem. Um, especially with larger plants. So you might be like, well, that's weird, but still could be purple loose drive, even if it doesn't have that perfect um, opposite leaf pairs. And then I uh, basically late in the season or really early in the season, you might still be able to recognize a new infestation um, kind of by looking for the skeletons of these plants. So you're there, especially larger woodier plants are going to be persisting uh, year round. You know, they're they're dead, but you're still going to be able to see those seeds. Um, and it's especially uh, if you're looking for some winter work and you find a big patch of these seeds, it might be holding on to some of the seed. Um, so that could be an opportunity to clef and bag. And, you know, it's not the ideal situation to find something after it's gone to seed and dropped most of it, but anything that you can keep from going to the seed bank is definitely a plus. Um, and then especially if you're finding new infestations like that, that can kind of key you in to look in the surrounding areas upstream and downstream um, for other plants. Um, so tricks to spotting, again, look for those habitats. Uh, if it is an area where the plants are not super dense, it can be good to use binoculars. Uh, a lot of times you'll see purple loose strife uh, in dense cattail patches. And as fun as it is to put on your waders and just trek right through it, um, if you've got an area that's not super dense, it can nice uh, to scout with binoculars, especially if you got a nice windy day and things are moving around that pink, it just kind of pops right out at you. Um, and then also um, there are situations, rivers, ponds, that sort of thing where it can make sense to scout and treat from um, boats if you have access. Um, so then as far as lookalikes here, swamp loosestrife is a native plant that's in the same family. Uh, they're both perennial plants. They look similar. The, one of the main differences here is that you're gonna have flowers occurring at the nodes, like in those leaves. In uh, purple loose drive, you're only gonna have that terminal inflorescence. So if you've got flowers happening in between the leaves, um, and we'll see that with a couple more, more lookalikes, then you know that you are not dealing with purple loose drive. Uh, again, smart weeds. Typically, this would be one that you would maybe confuse uh, when you're treating purple loose seedlings. Flowers, 
similar in color but much smaller and they're kind of round instead of being that more traditional like regular flower shape milkweeds um i feel like these pictures you know, like look at the picture you're like listen that does not look like purple loose stripe but if you're in the field especially some <laughs> soft milkweed will trick me um and then one characteristic that all milkweeds are going to have that purple white blue stripe does not is that if you break off a little piece it's going to have that milky sap um so that's sometimes you know just do yourself a favor and then maybe it doesn't have the milky sap and you're like you know what it is purple blue stripe um and then obviously once these start going into flower the flowers are, are significantly different but uh especially a swamp milkweed could be similar in color could catch your eye i uh, just want definitely to to keep an eye out for. And then blue river vein, again, um, these little inflorescences are gonna be generally like a little, um, little umbels. Uh, the flowers are much smaller. They do kind of have that same structure to them. I would say this one, like the vegetation and like the structure of the plant does look pretty similar to purple blue stripe, but um, the blue river vein is gonna have toothed leaves. Um, so that's one way that you can um, differentiate it from purple stripe. And then mints, we kind of talked about this one already, got those square stems. Uh, it's going to be very minty smelling uh, when you crush it in your hand. And then um, for just this um, common mint, it's going to have those flowers kind of in those uh, in those notes with those leaves. Uh, and then fireweed, I, this one is honestly more of a look like for the next species I'm going to go over. Um, but again, same color, kind of similar shaped plants, similar form, got that stacked inflorescence. Um, one thing, you're, this is not really an issue in the front range, but if you're doing treatments at higher elevations, you might see this. Um, and fl again, flowers are similar, but those leaves are going to be much more linear. Uh, and it's not an obligate wetland species. You might find it along creek edges, that sort of thing. Um, but if it's if it is an upland environment, then you're could it could it be purple or stripe? Yes, but that's it's unlikely. Um, so next species here, we got our hairy willow herb. Uh, it is a facultative wetland species throughout North America, which means it doesn't have to be in a wetland, but like generally, uh, it is. Mature plants are three to six feet tall. It's a perennial plant. It does go to seed. You can see in that far photo over there, it's got that like fluffy seeds um, to it, uh, but primarily is going to reproduce by, by rhizomes. So when you find one mature plant, make sure to look around because you're going to be finding a lot of little guys that are attached to it. Uh, Hairy willow habitats, you're going to find it generally in the same places in the same types of environments that you would find purple loose stripe. Uh, so especially if you've got purple loose drive sites that maybe you've been visiting for a while, I wouldn't be surprised, especially in the front range, if you're also seeing hairy blow herb in those same sites. Um, kind of another weird one, that far site there, that's a weird place for cattails, but obviously it's it's irrigated enough um, that it's able to support cattails and like a little hairy blow herb in there. And I just walk my dogs past that, but, <laughs> but I will, I'll do something about it. Um, Okay, so floral and seed pod characteristics here. We're looking at those bright pink flowers. Uh, stamens is like that little white plus sign. Um, and seed pods are gonna be like long and skinny. And then when they reach maturity, they're gonna fleece out. Uh, so that far guy you can see is um, reached the point where like you wouldn't wanna deal with it. So it is beneficial to be able to treat these a little bit earlier in the season. Vegetative characteristics here. So this one's going to have a round stem. Uh, it's hairy willow herb. Uh, so that stem especially is covered in soft hairs. Um, and then besides that, I mean, structurally pretty similar to uh, purple loose stripe. You're going to see kind of branching at those nodes where the leaves are attached. Leaves uh, two to four inches long, half an inch wide. Uh, and compared to some of the native willow herbs that we're going to go into in the next slides, uh, they are kind of like floppy. <laughs> uh, with, with the native willow herbs, they're going to hold their leaves a little bit um, tighter to the stem and be like a little bit more, um, I don't know, sh like sharp looking. Uh, I guess another thing with the hairy willow, willow herb vegetation, there is like a pretty distinct smell to it. 
um, it's like kind of like a sweet or like some people think it smells like sweet cream. I think it kind of smells like bubble gum. It's not like as obvious uh, as like a mint or like something that's like very, like you're like, okay, I, I can like picture what a mint smells like. But if you're someone who is working with Harry Willow or a lot, you know, just smell it. Or you might be like, Emily has lost her mind and this doesn't smell like anything. Um, but if it helps you idea, it's worth a shot. So lots of native willow herbs in Colorado, uh, 11 different species at a variety of elevations. All, pretty much all of them are, are going to be much smaller and more delicate um, in their both their vegetation and in their flowers. These are the species that we see most often throughout the front range. Um, I would say never I do something just on color alone, but I feel like generally with these native willow herbs, we will see more um, like red stems and like red leaves um, versus our hairy willow herb is, is typically that bright like lime green. And then on the website, uh, we've got a resource that basically breaks down some different characteristics of the top three um, willow herbs that you're going to see in the front range uh, and the kind of characteristics so you can differentiate them from a uh, hairy willow herb. Uh, I would also say if you ever, I'm sure if you have questions, feel free to take a business card, text me some pictures. They, they got to be good pictures. If you text me pictures and they are blurry, I am not going to be happy. Um, <laughs> I'll be like, eh. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think the more that you that you're able to work with it, uh, the better you're going to be with identification. But it does take a long time to feel confident, and like that's okay. It's okay to not be 100% sure all the time. Um, but you know, we get a second opinion, we, we move forward. Uh, yellow flag iris. This one, ID wise, piece of cake. Uh, we're going to see it in the same places that we see hairy willow herb um, and purple loose stripe, more or less. Flowers made in July. Uh, it's the only like yellow iris that you're going to see really in Colorado, with minus like maybe some ornamental stuff that's not going to be like in a pond. Um, spreads by rhizomes, reproduces by both seeds and rhizomes, and it's got that really characteristic like iris flower. Um, so it's got like their modified petals and sepals basically. Um, yeah. I couldn't find the labeled yellow flower, but obviously this, they would be yellow. Um, and then those seed pods, it's like a little bunch of plantains kind of, you break it open, got a bunch of seeds in there. Uh, they are buoyant, again, transported by water, um, not ideal. And because this one was recently listed, I think that the extent and distribution is probably a little bit wider than maybe we currently know. So if you are finding this species, please report it in AdMaps. Um, also, there potentially is EDR funding available for this. So if you're finding populations that don't have the resources to treat them, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, and then kind of a lookalike that I would say is like the main one vegetatively is going to be cattails. And a lot of times they're going to be in the, in the same environments. Uh, the main difference is going to be that cattails, if you reach down to the base, it's going to be round versus uh, our yellow flag iris is going to be more of like an elliptical, like kind of sharp on both sides. Uh, I feel like even this screenshot, uh, I pulled off somebody's foraging website, uh, but basically I feel like it might even be missing a couple, um, couple outer leaves. Because because if you feel it, you will be able to feel those sharp edges on both sides versus a cattail that's going to be perfectly round. Um, so flowering rush, this is one of the ones that we talked about. They, there was a population in Colorado. Um, the leaves, I would say it's more similar to a bulrush than yellow flag iris, but could you know you could mistake it. Um, currently not known in the state, but got has, has like pretty charismatic flowers that don't really look like much else. Uh, from a distance, I think maybe it could look like bulrush, but those are not going to be like pink flowers. It's going to be more of like a, like a grass or like sedge little flower. Um, Oops, let's see that this, that's, that's out of that border. <laughs> uh, look alike for the yellow flag iris, really um, the only one that you would probably encounter when we are doing treatments in natural areas um, is going to be our wild iris. Uh, it's an upland species, it's much smaller, it's the flowers are blue. Um, 
but you know, with when it's not in flower, you could see those similar seed pods, similar form, that sort of thing. So just one to be aware of that it, it is, exists. Um, and then Phragmites. So this is actually a watchlist species, but one that potentially we're going to see in or near water. Um, in 2017, there was a genetic study, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull up that map. There's also a lot of native Phragmites in the state of Colorado. So the reason that this species is on the watch list and will always stay on the watch list uh, is because the non-native is invasive enough probably to be listed, but it's uh, the difference between the native and the, and the non-native is at a subspecies level and we list on the species level. So if we were to list the species, then it would be like, okay, well, you're also mandated to treat the native, which obviously we're not gonna do. It doesn't behave invasively. Um, and there's no need to, uh, to go after that. So um, in the past, I, I would say like, um, you know, maybe CDA funding has been used to treat the invasive, but you would have to basically like pr prove that you have a, a, a population that is not native. Um, and then, I don't know, we've, there has been some interest recently in doing like another genetic testing, uh, but in the meantime, we do have this couplet available on our website so you can kind of walk yourself through um, through the key and determine if you've got a native or non-native population of Phragmites. Uh, final couple slides here, we got our control and reporting. So a couple types of control here, uh, cultural and preventative. In this context, uh, that's going to mean maybe for, for people who are working in weeds, making sure that you're not transporting seeds from site to site, especially if you are working on a species that maybe is only present in one place within your jurisdiction, you know, really making sure uh, that you're not taking seed with you, especially like very well aware that it will stick to you. Um, so just being really careful with that. Biological. Uh, you know, the CDA, we've got our insectary, we do a lot of different biological controls, but for list A species specifically, uh, we do not promote list A, or excuse me, biological control. Um, mechanical control, so that's going to be digging, mowing, that sort of thing. Uh, and then chemical control is the application of herbicides. So um, for mechanical control only, really for purple earth, striped hairy willow herb, and yellow fires, they're not great options, but if they're your only options, then you know we can we can take it in that direction. So in ornamental settings, if we got just a couple plants, organic farms, other places that you can't use herbicides for whatever reason, um, it can work to dig up plants as make, making sure that you are getting the entire root ball, uh, fragments of root, anything that could potentially reproduce. You're going to want to back off and take with you. Uh, and then when you have that, you're going to want to make sure that it goes into a landfill and not into a uh, chemical control, make sure you're working under a qualified uh, QS. That's qualified, qualified supervisor. Uh, <laughs> and if you are working in or near water, your QS needs to have an aquatic license. If you are not sure if that applies to you, our pesticide program can better answer any questions about licensing, uh, that sort of thing. If you, again, are applying near or um, to water, you do need to have an NPD. ES permit, uh, and that can be like per agency or per work group that every individual needs to have this permit. Um, and then you do need to uh, collect additional information when you're doing your record keeping. As far as selecting your chemicals and adjuvants for aquatic applications, you want to make sure that both are aquatic approved. Um, we've got fact sheets on the CDA website. I think that the recommendations are still valid, but definitely we are in the process of updating them. So I would say check in with the fact sheets, but also like obviously your supervisors, county weed managers, CSC extension agents, um, and see what has been done successfully where you are located. Um, and again, we're gonna be um, oops, looking at those labels for rates and following those labels for uh, instructions on use. And then depending on your site um, and other factors, you're gonna to wanna to look at the selectivity of the herbicides that you're choosing. Uh, for example, a lot of times we're gonna have purple loose strife and cattails in the same place. If you're using a non-selective herbicide, maybe you're gonna toast your cattails. 
that could be a good thing or a bad thing, but it depends on the situation, right? So just taking that into, into consideration when we're making those decisions. Um, and then every time you apply a chemical, you're going to want to make sure that you are keeping detailed records of the weather conditions, what you sprayed, where you sprayed, all the things. Um, and basically, uh, it's good because you can look back on what you've done if it's been successful. If it hasn't, then you can be like, okay, well, what rate did I spray? Why wasn't it successful? Or if you have an application that you're like, okay, this was great. You can see maybe the exact tank mix, do it again. Um, it also is going to protect you if you get audited or if there's a complaint filed against you. Um, and then again, the pesticide program is going to be better suited to answer any questions that you have specifically about um, record keeping, licensing, that sort of thing. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to get you in contact um, with them if you have a specific question. Uh, other considerations, so remember the label is the law, make sure that you are not applying more than the max uh, max rate per acre over the course of the year. Uh, if you've got a situation where there has been recent flooding, uh, which is you know pretty common is considering this is you know an aquatic species uh, training. So plants that are sediment covered or dusty are not always going to take up chemical as well. Sometimes we'll have issues with uh, binding, that sort of thing. Um, you're going to be wanting to look at the raincast window, which you can find in the label, and the weather, um, basically so you don't have to make multiple applications, but also it's uh, more environmentally friendly to apply the least amount of chemical uh, as you can. If you have to double apply, then that obviously is not ideal. Uh, looking at your spray pattern and droplet size, basically finding that sweet spot where your droplet size is large enough to minimize spray, or excuse me, uh, to minimize drift and not target um, damage. Uh, and then, unless there is a reason that you cannot, uh, I know every, we all are dealing with different things depending on our jurisdiction, but dye is really useful in order to be able to see what you are spraying. Uh, not only so you can see what you are hitting that is not on target, uh, but also uh, you can see if you're being exposed uh, to chemical. And then besides that, we've got our pesticide sensitive registry. Um, if you are making applications around private property, you're going to want to check and make sure that there is no one that you need to notify before your applications. And then depending on the location um, and uh, category that, that you're spraying under, uh, you may need to use pin flags. So um, again, Pesticides can tell you a little bit more about that if you have any questions. Uh, finally, I think we got a couple more slides here about PPE. You're going to look at the label for specific requirements here. Uh, generally, we're looking at long sleeves, long pants, shoes, socks, protective eyewear, and chemical resistant gloves. And even if you're wearing all your PPE and you feel like you're bulletproof, it's still best practices to not travel through areas that have been treated. Um, I know sometimes, especially like brand violence, you're like wearing waders, you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. But like you still have to touch that stuff after you get out of the wetland. So um, just really taking care to keep as much of that off as you can. And then generally for purple loose strife and hairy willow, we're in the field. Once it goes to flower, we're going to be using a combination of chemical and, and mechanical treatments. Um, so clipping those flower heads, taking the flowers out with us uh, in trash bags, and then going ahead and spraying that remaining vegetation. And as far as disposal, making sure that you're, tra you're using like heavy duty trash bags, you're not losing any seeds along the way um, from your site to where you're gonna dispose and then making sure that ends up in either a dumpster or you can bring directly to the landfill. Uh, finally, resources. So obviously like it's a big undertaking going after your list days, but it's really important. Um, the CDA offers grants. Uh, we've got different printed educational materials. The website is a really great resource. So fact sheets and information on the website. Uh, additionally, we put out a newsletter every two weeks. So we highlight different species to look out for depending on where we are in the season. Uh, we'll add, you know, include things, trainings, grants, uh, other opportunities. Um, so definitely if you're not already signed up for that, you can sign up on the website. Um, I've got my seasonal staff, and then obviously, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself, Emily Gilbert, or Patty York directly, um, or we've got like a weeds, weeds email, 
Um, so if you want, if you're like, I don't know exactly who to ask this question to, you can just ask it to all three of us at once and then whoever it makes sense to respond will do it. Um, and then finally, your county weed managers and extension agents are really good resources. They are gonna know what is locally, um, locally where you're at, and they're gonna be able to make good, good recommendations on chemical, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's all I got. Unless there's another slide. Oh, there's one more slide. Um, <laughs> all right. So finally, this is actually my last slide. We got Ed Maps. I can't believe I forgot about Ed Maps. So basically, all grantees of the CDA um, weed fund money are required to submit uh, data to Ed Maps as part of the, the grant agreement, basically. But we encourage everyone who has the time and resources to do so. Uh, it's a free website. You can make a free account. Basically, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to, to report every single thing that you spray, but especially our list A stuff uh, and our high priority list Bs. Really helpful if you are able to report any populations that you are dealing with because that information we do use to make management decisions um, and the law moving forward. Um, not exclusively, but it is something that we look at. So the more information we have, the better. Um, and again, if anybody has questions specifically about AdMaps, there's some really good training resources on AdMaps. Like you can watch a recorded webinar if you've never submitted a record before, and it'll take you, you know, step by step exactly what you need to do. Um, if you have any questions specifically, please let me know. And that's all I got. Thank you guys so much. Um, I guess if there are any questions for anyone. All right. Um, okay. Can you reiterate where virtual attendees can access the CE forms and how to get them signed for virtual attendees? Yes. Okay, so if you're online, as long as your your username is your name that is on your pesticide license, all you need to do is put your license number into the chat and then we do everything else. So we will just confirm that you are here at all time and then submit the forms. Um, to uh, the pesticides division and you'll get those credits. Um, if your name is something different, maybe put your name and your number um, and then we should have everybody's email. So if there's any questions or issues, then we can reach out, but we'll take care of the rest. All right, do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering with the frag mites, has there been evidence of them hybridizing? That is a good question. Not that I know of, but I also am not 100% sure. It also, I think, is something that like we probably will revisit soon. Um, so if you've got, I guess, if you have got populations where you're like, I'm not sure, or I think it might be hybridizing, that those may be nice to, to get tested to know for sure. Um, is there anything else from anybody on, online? Check this out real quick. And Larry, do you think we're good? Yeah, there are two answers and uh, or questions and you answered both. Okay. All right, hold on. I'm All right, I guess just to wrap it up, thank you guys, everybody, for coming. Uh, I, might, I can't tell if I'm still sharing my screen. Thanks for putting up with our little technical issues. Um, but besides that, if you have a CDC form in person, uh, Robert or I can sign it for you and we'll like give you that pink slip or whatever and you can be on your way. Uh, everybody online, thank you guys so much uh, for coming. Please reach out if you have any questions or comments. And everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>